Hello and welcome to Two Wizards and a Mic, where we talk about D&D and how cool it is because we're close to death because we're old or something. <laughs> I got really morbid very, very fast. But uh, hi, I'm Shane and to my left or right. I am Andrew. And uh, before we talk about what we're talking about this week, which we are going to dive into some uh, very cool, uh, I don't know, what do you want to call them? An amazing creature that has all kinds of potential. But we have a Kickstarter running. Well, I don't. You do. Tell us what is the latest on that update. Well, the update for Monsters of Feyland 2 is that uh, we are in the final week now. So the Kickstarter will end exactly a week from uh, 6 p.m. Pacific time tonight, which is so the last night is uh, June 7th, next Tuesday. And we are 90% funded, which is really good. We don't have that far to go. We have over 450 backers to make a new book in our monster series with up to 120 monsters and a lot more. You're going to get magic items and flora like fungi and you're going to get maps and you're going to get uh, potentially some more subclasses to play for uh, d and and you're going to get a lot more than just than just a monster book. Uh, this is the fifth in the series. And as I said, we don't have that much further to go. And to celebrate that tonight, we're going to do a giveaway for a couple of our other books. So Hello, our everyone. last book is Monsters of the Wilderness. So we are going to give away two copies, two soft cover copies of the Monsters of the Wilderness. So this was our biggest book. This um, The new book, Feyland 2, will be just as big, hopefully. And uh, this one has 123 monsters. And a lot more. You've got uh, tables for the wilderness, uh, detailed resources to run campaigns in the wilderness, magic items, and it's fully illustrated, all in color. And we are giving away free copies. And all you have to do is look in the links below and send us a message on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and tell us the name of this show on YouTube. <laughs> Awesome. And the name of Shane's first dog. No, I'm just kidding. You just have to say <laughs> the name of the show. Send us a message, a direct message on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, and um, we'll choose two names. And we'll get a hold of those people. And we'll mail these out to you free of charge. That is cool because I have that book. And it's great. So, um Two copies of Monsters of the Wilderness, Oswald's Curse, are going to be given away. And as Andrew said, don't forget to uh, to read the stuff in the thing and you'll figure out how to join. But today, we are talking about probably one of the most iconic creatures out there that are right behind dragons, in my opinion. The Beholder. Now, what is that beholder you have there? Is that a particular type or is that just a very cool design? It's a modern version of the beholder. Nice. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, I think they're the best monster there is. <laughs> they're very iconic because I don't think they come from anywhere else than from Dungeons and Dragons, from the beginnings of D&D. Um, and they first appeared in the original monster manual they are aliens, and there's not that many of these sorts of creatures in D&D, although we make a lot of these creatures uh, for our monster books. They're called aberrations. Uh, mind flayers are aberrations, aboliths, uh, sladi, which are death slads, and uh, different kinds of slads. So there's not many alien creatures in D&D, but um, I think it's always a fun monster to use. Because sort of like Feyland, there's no rules. If you have an alien monster, you could make it do whatever you want. Oh, exactly. So, um, yeah, they're they're pretty cool. And the, they have this very iconic shape of a sphere and um, a large central eye. And then um, eye stalks on top, 10 eye stalks. And then a big mouth filled with pointed teeth. And they levitate constantly. So they float around this big spherical ball that floats around the world. Um, and, and that's going to be hard. one of the coolest part about them is that 
you can encounter them anywhere. It doesn't really matter. You could, you could be like, oh, well, don't forget, uh, be careful, don't jump into the lava or fall in. And then this beholder just kind of like, I don't care, I'm just going to fly over this stuff and I'm going to eat you. <laughs> uh, like that kind of cool stuff can happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, really and very cool way, the way they move around, like you say, very unique. Um, they're extremely aggressive, so they're great for dungeon masters because these things will just attack immediately, usually. Um, they're hateful and greedy, and they dismiss all other creatures as lesser beings. So they're quite xenophobic. Um, they think they are the greatest thing since sliced bread and everything else is horrible. Um, <laughs> they also always suspect that everybody is plotting against them. So they're sort of like this insane mind that never stops thinking. That's basically what they are. Um, and there's really not a lot of famous beholders. I could I can only really think of one who's consistently mentioned, and that is a creature called the Xanathar. It's actually wow. not one beholder. That's the title, like the Godfather. And so it's called the Xanathar, and it is uh, the leader of the Thieves Guild um, and the um, Slaves Guild, which is also known as the Xanathar Guild, in the city of Waterdeep. And we actually have an adventure that we wrote called Hunting the Xanathar for a high-level party, which you can get on DMs Guild. And um, I did have one person, when we first started, we first published that adventure, who said, why didn't you just call it Hunting Xanathar? And then they came, then they emailed me back and said, oh, oh, yeah, right. You, it's called The Xanathar. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, I mean, the the other thing too is that creating creatures like this that I I don't know how how litigious is Wizards of the Coast in protecting their IP. Oh wait, they are. They're I mean they I mean they're very open about it. They're also very like, well, here is the thing that you can follow as long as you don't do right. this, this, and this, you're okay. Right. Um, in that kind of world. Uh, but uh, the the thing uh, I was trying to remember was there a beholder in the that D, &D uh, tv show the cartoon from the 80s i seem to recall there was but i don't remember if it had a name oh that's a good question i don't remember that i, I know there are some people who sort of look back on it that fondly that show was fun to have because there was nothing really in pop culture like connected to D, &D other than a short scene in et um but the show wasn't very good. Like if you go back and watch it, it's. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's it's horrible. It's. But I I would not want to watch it now. No, gosh, no. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, maybe there was. I don't remember. But I there's not like sort of a. I think other than the Xanathar, there's not really any single name that stands out. Um. So you have quite a few versions of beholders now, of course. So the uh, there is the regular beholder, and then there's one called the Eye Tyrant, which is still the same stats, but it's one who's not as paranoid and as xenophobic, and it leads a group of people. Um, basically, the Xanathar is a version of the Eye Tyrant. Um, then you have the Death Tyrant, which is an undead version of the um, beholder, which is even more powerful. Um, you have the spectator, which is a smaller version. Uh, and then in Volo's guy, or actually there's also the zombie beholder, I should mention, which is another undead version. And then in Volo's, they added the gazer, the goth and the death kiss, all smaller versions of beholders. So the regular beholder, usually they're usually lawful evil. So perfect for a thieves guild leader, like the Xanathar. Right. <clears throat> they have quite a lot of hit points. So you're talking maximum for the regular beholder around 270 hit points. Ace armor class 18. They don't fly quickly. They don't levitate quickly, just 20 feet. But with all the things they can do, that's not that important. They have perception plus 12. So with their big eye and their eye, they have eyes on all their um, eye stalks. Uh, they're always looking in all the all directions. They're always paying attention. So it's going to be very hard to sneak up on a beholder. They have dark vision for 120 feet. So that is a really um, big consideration because 
if they can see well ahead of the party, they can attack well before the party sees them. They also speak deep speech and undercommon. Uh, undercommon is the, this language from the Underdark that the drow speak, for example, and I think mind players speak that too. Um, and the regular beholder is CR 13, the death tyrant CR 14, so pretty tough. And they have um, they do have a bite attack, but their main abilities are one, this anti-magic cone, which within this cone, this sort of field, there's no spells, no magic items can function, any summoned creatures vanish, and uh, it is a massive, massive weapon to use. So the one the one caveat to remember is that the beholders rays won't work in this field. So basically what they have to do is look with their main eye at their area where they have their anti-magic cone. And then the other eye stalks are then going to shoot rays at other targets out of that field. So basically a beholder would target the spell casters, put the anti-magic field on them, and then use its eye stalks to shoot rays at the other party members. And they have 10 rays, 10 eye stalks. That is, that is brutal. <laughs> like, yeah. Like it's just killing played machine. well. Oh, my God. Oh, like, yeah. It's a hell. killing machine. So they have 10 rays. So there's charm, paralyzing, fear, which is probably one of the least dangerous ones, slowing, enervation, telekinetic. So it can just pick stuff up and drop it on you. Uh, sleep ray. Wonderful petrification, and then the two great ones, disintegration. So that's a save or 10 D8 force damage. And if you re reduce to zero, you're a pile of, fame, of fine gray dust. The death ray yeah. is 10 D10 necrotic damage, unless you save. And if you reduce to zero, you're dead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they also I hate, I hate these only, things, but I love them. Do they have that, but they have legendary actions. So three times between their attack and their next attack, they can attack after another creature and use another ray attack. They're brutal. Yeah. I remember that your party was scouting out a flying castle and you were sure that bandits were the ones who were in control of this castle and the, because of the actions in this area, this territory. Right. So yeah. you you found your way onto the castle, you snuck inside, but you didn't do you didn't do any reconnaissance on the castle itself. You just snuck in. And once you're inside, you defeated all these bandits and other creatures and you finally came to the central chamber and you saw what you thought was the bad leader and these clothes fell away and it was actually a beholder. <laughs> I, just, I, I just remember thinking like there's this large, you know, jacket that's been buttoned up and there's like this, you know, a couple of eyes at the top or something. And then just like, <laughs> like kids yeah. trying to get into an adult film, you know, if they are, you know, stacked on top of each other. Yes, of course I'm a mailman. But yeah, that th I, I I that was one yeah, of those so, moments where it's like always do reconnaissance before storming the castle. I mean, that's kind of the rule. I mean, sure, you could just go in, you know, guns blazing. But ultimately, uh, if you're not prepared in any way, like there was, I'm pretty sure there was lore out there we could have discovered that said, I I, I think the leader's actually a beholder. <laughs> I mean, he's this big guy with this huge wig. It's so weird. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you get there and it's like, ha ha! You know, <laughs> yeah. Like the villain and at the end of a Scooby-Doo movie. Exactly. Scooby-Doo. The result of that was half the party died. Yeah. That, that sucked. Yeah. And you weren't low level. Like, your party was... I seem to think we're like 13th or 14th level, somewhere in there, 12th level. Yeah, there. for sure 10th level, somewhere between 10th and 15th, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, they are a piece of work. There's something for Dungeon Masters to 
I try to be use them sparingly uh, because they are so dangerous. So as I said, Volo's guide includes some new versions and they also have an entire section, a uh, great lore, which now they're seems like they're getting rid of, but they have this great lore section on beholders where it tells you all about their lairs and it gives you tables for their bonds and flaws, which are hilarious, by the way. Um, I'll just read a few of them here. They also yeah, have please. tables about traps um, that the 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 um, the characteristics, like what color the beholder would be, what shape the eye would be, um, what their henchmen and what their pets would be like. So there's this whole section. This is the the alternate cover for um, Volo's guide. Oh yeah, yeah, it's a good cover. So right at the beginning of their lore section about monsters, the first one is the Beholder. And uh, I think these are hilarious. So they have, of course, the ideals and bonds and flaws. So an example for, um, the Beholder ideal, Perfection. Although I am as perfect as I am, I can strive to be even better. <laughs> <laughs> um, and a personality trait. I am weary of frequent interruptions. Well, I mean, that would definitely set somebody off. If you have all these people just walking into your lair all the time looking for your treasure, I would be, you know, a little, little cheesed off. Okay, here's another one. I enjoy lording my superiority over others. Oh, they always do that. Although I rarely, I'm trying to think of how many conversations my characters I've played have actually had conversations <laughs> with, like, have they actually talked to one of these? Because I usually, usually it's like, run away or fight yeah. it, kill it. Like there's yeah. really no you know, discussion. It would be kind of cool to have a discussion with a beholder though. Yeah. Uh, cold, emotionless, Emotionless logic is the way that I defeat my foes. <laughs> um, and here are the flaws. Um, I usually ignore the advice of my minions. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, to be honest with the ego on flaw. them like that, I mean, why not? I think that's my flaw, actually. Um Yeah, another one. There's a lot about dreaming with beholders. So one of their other flaws is I frequently have terrifying dreams. And I often take out my frustrations on my minions. I, I minions, sometimes get the party. Oh, wait. Oh, I, I sometimes that. forget that others don't have access to all of my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> that wait, that's, that's your is flaw. my flaw. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, one of the other super cool things is that they're layers. So because they can float, their layers can be in any direction. So they they have often have tunnels, but their tunnels can also be vertical. Like have, if you've seen video of astronauts in the space station, basically the same yeah. thing. So um, it's usually subterranean, large tunnels, escape tunnels. They have a prison. They often have trophy rooms. Uh, they often set up traps because, again, if they're not on the ground, a lot most traps have to do with being on the ground. They can just float by, right? They have pit traps and other things that their minions have built. The beholder can just float by, and then you, the party's chasing it and falls into a pit trap. <laughs> can they fly, like, really high up in the air? I don't. I think I've only ever encountered them when they're close to the ground. Is there a limitation? On, well, I think I, the DM, I would assume not, but maybe I don't well, know. Well, other than atmospheric pressure, yeah. Exactly. I think, <laughs> yeah, we defeated him. He's twenty thousand <laughs> feet in the air and he explodes. <laughs> yes, let's get on this flying device that'll take us to another yeah, continent. Come you with have us. To remember, most of the time you don't have to worry about monsters being that smart in D and D. But as you get to higher levels, you definitely do. And the Beholder is a good example. You're not going to outfox this character. You know, he's not going to start floating up into the air. Um, the cool thing with Beholders, too, is that like some legendary creatures like dragons, they
they actually affect the area around them. So a regular beholder in its lair, it can actually make the area slimy so much so that um, it's difficult terrain. It can also make appendages sprout from the walls and grab a hold of you. And it can also open up an eye somewhere in the lair on the wall and shoot one of its eye rays through it. That I did not remember reading when I read that that book. That's actually terrible. Like <laughs> that's yeah. that is hey, okay, so it's over there and yeah. it doesn't see us right now. Oh crap. <laughs> this little eyeball sort of staring at you. Hello. Exactly. Um, Would you like a disintegration ray? Although I like the randomness of that. Like that, it, it could be yeah. something where it's like, I'm suddenly slow, uh, rather than, you know, you're yeah. making a death save against. So there's also, so those are layer actions for the regular beholder. They also have regional effects for the regular one. So one of those is that creatures within one mile feel as if they're being watched, even if they're not. <laughs> That's always a good one. And, um, if you um, take a, if you sleep in that area, strange minor warps in reality can occur. So, for example, you know maybe a rock will suddenly change color, or a tree will suddenly lose all its leaves, like without warning, you know, completely randomly. So, that's another kind of effect. Um, the death tyrant has similar effects in its lair. And the regional effects are similar, except when you take a long rest after finishing it, you have to roll a d20. And if you roll 10 or lower, a random eye will suddenly blast you from the eye tyrant, the death tyrant somewhere in the, in the region, like just within a mile of the, within a mile of the lair. Do you want to hear a really just... nasty dungeon master trick with a beholder? Yes, please. All right. So there is a certain fungi monster in D&D called a gas spore. Okay. So imagine your party is going through a dark cavern. And then up ahead, you see a spherical floating creature floating along slowly through the dark. And it looks like it might have some appendages above. And one of the party yells, it's a beholder. And they like quickly, you know, hit it with a lightning bolt or shoot it with an arrow. It's a gas spore. Guess what happens when you hit it or you kill it? It explodes. Yeah. <laughs> I. That would be terrifying. So uh, I that, think that what do they explode into? Well, it's I was like just going to a... say. Originally, I could be wrong. I'd have to double check. But originally, I think in AD&D, it was an explosion that happened and you took force damage, I think. But now what happens is there's spores that go out and uh, d damage you, but also they infect you and other spores can grow inside and kill you. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, here we go. So releasing a poisonous gas and a large number of spores that reach about 20 feet in diameter. Oh, wow. Oh, God. Yeah. Becoming infected with this type of magic for a long period. Oh, wow. Yeah. That is so evil. But I love it's it. A good, it's a really good <laughs> trick. I've used it. <laughs> um, and then I have... Um, oh, yeah. I should mention, too, that... Um, they have this strange, again, they, they don't sleep, they dream. And there is the possibility when they're dreaming about themselves, because they, they're very um, vain and arrogant, so they could dream about themselves or they can dream about another beholder. They hate other beholders too. And there's the chance that when they're dreaming that they can actually um, create another beholder in their image that appears in another location or they can change and morph into a new version of a beholder. So they can like evolve into different kinds of beholders? Well, it's kind of devolving because they're they're going they're turning into an undead version of the beholder, the death. Oh, type. only undead. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, but they can also they can also um 
create smaller beholders um, in their dreams who now appear at a different location as well. And I wrote down um, as cons for the beholder, none. <laughs> and pros, <laughs> what did I write? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's it's kind of like, um, it, it reminds me, the way that you've described them definitely reminds me of like an alien from the alien film. Like they're the, they're the perfect creature. They are... Uh, like the, but I had never thought of the whole, you know, essentially them breeding is. Yeah, they don't. I had a dream don't. about a bunch of different guys. Oh, yep. Suddenly there's 10 more beholders in the world after my weird dream this morning. Exactly. Yeah. Their reproduction, if that wasn't clear from what I was saying, it's what you just said. Their reproduction is not biological. It's mental and psychic. Basic, mostly that is mental. Could you imagine, like, that would be evil. Like, what if you actually ever got, like, a death tyrant who was able to control their dream? Like, hey, when I dream, these things happen. If I could control that dreaming, wouldn't it be cool if, like, there were 20,000 more of me right now? <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to like it, but they'll help me kill some stuff and take over some stuff. So, you know, I guess that's a win-win. <laughs> <laughs> and the party just decides, I'm just going to put my weapons down, burn your spell books, just forget it, we're toast. <laughs> yeah. But you have a best-selling adventure uh, for something on some website. What's it called? The DM something? The DM's Guild. Um, yes, and that adventure basically is that the Xanathar has been up, you know, he's always up to no good, but he's caused so much chaos in Waterdeep that the uh, city is hiring a group of adventurers to just hunt him down and kill him. <laughs> so yeah. it's for it's for a party of 17th level of, and above <laughs> because there's multiple beholders in that adventure, spoiler alert. And yeah. Um, it is, yeah, it's something to try to, to deal with. Plus you have to fight the Thieves Guild as well. So, yeah, well, uh, you know. That goes with the territory when you're yeah. hunting. Yeah, well, I know I was going to mention there's tables for minions, for the henchmen, for the beholder in the Volos book. So here's some examples. Um, 10d6 bugbears and the bu bugbear chiefs. 10d10 uh, plus 50 bandits plus their captains. 10d10 um, plus 50 goblins. <laughs> so in... Th so you could like have 150 goblins appear out of nowhere. Well, like these would these would just these would, these would be creatures in the in the beholder's lair or under their control in their in their region. Oh, okay. So not like right beside them. Like, hey guys, guess what? Ah, uh, 150 friends of mine just showed up to kill you. Well, they mention also <laughs> they actually have a list for greater minions. So these might be more like bodyguards. Oh, wow. That includes like. Um, Two fire giants. Fire giants are tough. Um, there's manticores, mini like 3d6 min minotaurs, 18 minotaurs. That's a nasty thing to deal with. Um, and then they have pets as well, including having basilisks as pets, uh, chimeras, even like one to three beholder zombies. That would be hard to deal with. That would be just brutal. 2d4 oh. ropers remember imagine having to deal with the beholder that has eight <laughs> eight ropers as its pets that would suck <laughs> those things those things are so easy to come by but they're just so just there's they suck they're just awful yeah. i mean there are ways to deal with them but if you're you know but usually you encounter like maybe two maybe three but you know have a dozen of them show up or eight of them show up yeah I mean, yeah yeah that's so I'm thinking cool. right now that I have to make an adventure where there's an incredibly valuable treasure at the center of a lair and it's a beholder's lair. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be cool. I mean, they kind of, they kind of remind me of like, we sort of did that in the adventure in the DM, DMs guild, but it's right. a little bit different because you, you, the, the main goal is to hunt down and eliminate the, the beholder. <laughs> Sorry. What were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say, they kind of remind me of like, uh, Jabba and his family, you know, oh yeah, that they're, they're 
they don't like each other. They tolerate each other. You know, these kinds of things. They're not yeah. as powerful as a beholder would be, but oh my gosh. Like, yeah, no, it's very, that's a good point. Although I think the beholder is probably smarter than Jabba. I mean, Jabba yeah, it would not, would, it wouldn't smart, surprise me. But I, I think like these guys are geniuses. These are genius level yeah. intelligence. Um, I, I wouldn't say that Jabba is a genius. No, um, he's just a thug. <laughs> With yeah. <money. laughs> He's pretty clever, but I don't think he's on the, these. I mean, a beholder could take him out easily. <laughs> you know, this has actually given me uh, all kinds of ideas about how one could utilize, uh, you know, a beholder. I mean, they're 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 brilliant. They are how Very rare good. are they? Are they sort of a rare creature? Like you see oh, yeah. them once in a blue moon? Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Remember, they hate other beholders. They're very suspicious of anybody. Um, so they like, most of them live by themselves in isolated, you know, very, um, yeah, very isolated locales. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you've got it. I think those really iconic monsters, from my point of view, you really got to save them and not overuse them. Otherwise, they just don't mean that much. So yeah. for me, when I, when a dragon arrives or a beholder arrives, it's there's got to be a lot of build up and it it really should mean something kind of like mind flares you don't see them that often either unless you yeah. decide to trip over something and fall into the underdark but uh, well but definitely they are not going to be wandering around doing too much that yeah i was i was really hoping that your party that was uh, recently in the underdark was finally going to come face to face with mind flares cuz you never have and as soon as you found out there were mind flayers around, I think that was one of the main impetuses to flee the Underdark as soon as possible. Yeah, I think we, I seem to remember in that particular adventure that we either saw a mind flare at a distance yeah, or uh, and something. And yeah, and that was basically, there's the exit. Let's, we've got the thing. Why are we still here? Let's get out of here. There's the exit right there. Yeah, that's basically, yeah. Well, I mean, they're they're just equally brutal. I mean, they are kind. I mean, they're they're very different, but in my mind, they're equally brutal to like a beholder, where just in a very different way. Uh, mainly because it's it's like the. Uh, remember a couple, uh, maybe a year or so, a couple years ago, they had that. Uh, there was some Wizards of the Coast new book announcement or a new whatever, and they had this little animated film that yeah, yeah. were all these beholders like exploding out of people's bodies and things, uh, because that's like that's how they procreate. But that was actually kind of terrifying. Like it's it's like oh wow cool yeah, but then later on you think about it like if I was playing a game and the beholders were you know that active doing that you know whatever they were the, the point was mm -hmm. uh that that would be just yeah that's he just that's as terrifying as one beholder like yeah because i guess mind flayers don't necessarily hang out by themselves that often they i guess they do i don't know we'll talk about it in another episode when we yeah we'll definitely deal with mind flayers yeah they're a bit different they're like you say the end result can still be pretty nasty but the big difference with the beholder is that it can hit you from long range multiple yeah. attacks as we said before it can be in the dark um and the anti-magic uh, is a big problem and the death tyrant version has a different kind of field where if you're in that field you can't regain hit points so it is that's just those are the, worse yeah those are the kind of challenges that make it very challenging for players when you're when you can't regain hit points or undead attacks that take your hit points away and you can only get them back when you rest or when you get remove curse. Um, that, and that's more old school D&D. That's like at the beginning when undead creatures could, could take levels from characters. They could, or they could lower your ability scores or they could take levels off you. You know, you're a fourth level fighter. You run into this wraith and it takes two levels off you. You're now a second level fighter. Um, I think that kind of stuff is great because there's consequences and the game is challenging and, you know, it, it helps everybody pay attention. 
I agree. Uh, and I, I, you and I have talked about this before about uh, how to find that balance between the, the, the risk and the consequence, because um, I've played with players that just, you know, it's like, there they are, let's go get them. And they go off and it's like, yeah. okay, well, I know that we're all halflings and we're going to go up against a fire giant and we're all level one bards. Why are we doing this? No, we have to get them. The treasure's on the other side. And that's actually the key point is that I, I, I always think that treasure is cool, but because you can get items that'll benefit your character and things like that, but it's not the end goal for me in, in, in role playing. It's, and it's that sort of rushing ahead stuff that kind of makes me sad and, and you know, when players do that without really thinking about it and the consequences part is, is great because, you know, yeah, it looks like a beholder. Yep. It's a oh no, it's a death tyrant. Oh, and you <laughs> disintegrated into, de into dust. I'm you know, sorry. It sucks to be you. It's like, what do you mean? My character's dead. Uh, yeah, well, you don't get any of the treasure and suddenly you're feeling like you're a, you're maybe a, a barmaid at a bar <laughs> in a tavern nearby five miles from where you just died. Like these kinds of yeah. things, like consequences are so important because it gives you that balance and, and that level of, you know, nervousness and fear that maybe I shouldn't go after the beholder with an ax. I should probably, you know, steer clear or come up with a great plan where we could maybe be successful. And yeah. Yeah. I can teach you. Part. Yeah. I think also, you know, your teacher, your teacher, I don't know why I said that your, your player, um, when they or player when your character dies um it can teach you to oh that's why i was thinking about teaching because oh, right, it, can yeah. teach you, it can teach you to be more strategic in the game which used to be a huge part of the game and has sort of faded away and then i and personally in my campaigns i try to encourage it for the party to really plan things out and i mean of course plans can go sideways but um there are ways to um mitigate some of the dangers that your characters will face and it's fun to do that yeah. i think no it is because danger is always a good thing and especially when you're role playing because yeah if you don't have any fear of anything then it gets boring like it i don't want to just be the guy who runs into a you know into a a dungeon you know, hell bent on getting the treasure that's that's supposed to be at the end. Um, I remember uh, at the beginning of of um, against the giants, the first module. There's a a hidden sword in a closet or something, a plus one giant sword or something, whatever it was. And I remember uh, playing with people in that adventure over and over and over again over the years. Uh, and people just suddenly started going to that closet for no reason. They'd walk in. They're supposed to be brand new there. It's like, I'm yeah, going to yeah. go to this closet. It's like, yeah, oh, come on. Oh, there's nothing there. What do you mean there's nothing there? There's supposed to be a thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, running you know what I'm here. Do? I'd stick a boggart in there. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> I should have done that. But 12 year old me was not so bright. <laughs> That did that did happen for me though. Um, not that a few years ago when we started playing Fifth Edition in the Strahd campaign, I realized that someone had already read it, and they'd read the module, and I'm doing the module. So what did I do to totally change things up? Is I reversed all the characters' alignments except for Strahd. Oh. So so there is a faction, for example. I think there was a faction of, well, there's this one faction anyway, who in the book are, or maybe it was two, a couple of factions where I just, I switched them. So now this person was completely confused with what was going on. Um, they didn't know. And I, all I'd done was switch everything, you know, you know, one from one side to the other. So they could have figured it out, um, but they didn't. And it was enough to add a uh, random um, element into the game that, you know, they couldn't tell what was going on um, and they didn't know who to trust. And um, yeah, there are things you can do to mitigate that always. Well, yeah, I, I think actually that was the first adventure I joined uh, the uh, West of the Wood group. And it was already like a third of the way in kind of thing. 
um, somewhere in there, something like that anyway. It was around yeah. that time. And I had read the module, but I'd read the old one. Right. Um, I hadn't read the new version of it. So I was lost. I knew where the winery was. I seem to recall there right. was a winery. Yeah. And I remember at some point we got to like a crossroads and it said winery. I'm like, oh, well, the winery is that way. And but I did not remember what was at the winery, and right, I think we right. actually went to the winery. And it's like, yeah. So we anyway, seventy five hundred vampires show up, <laughs> and the building explodes, and uh, you get sucked into a big wormhole. Like uh, uh, that. Yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah, that was actually <laughs> one of the locations that I changed the faction. So the faction that was there were supposed to be on the party's side, but I switched it so they weren't. I believe. And oh, uh, yeah, you know, I, I have a vague memory of us getting there and no one liked us at all. Yeah. Um, there was and a then huge suddenly fight. we were attacked. Yeah. Yeah. I think we huge... were, yeah, we think we were attacked like almost like almost right away. Yeah. I think we went inside and then suddenly it was like, oh, there's nothing here. Oh, well, we got outside. And then suddenly it's like, who are all these things? Like, what yeah. are, when did they get here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's the best part about, about all of this stuff is that you're right you can mitigate and change and, and do stuff like i remember we did a, a tomb of horrors kind of thing and i know tomb of horrors way too the old one anyway right. and i was actually happy that you were like changing things and i would be like i don't think that i don't remember that being there but that's a good idea because i don't really kind of want to know where i'm going i kind of want right. to you know be surprised like everybody else yeah yeah i'm like that too i, I would rather as a player have no idea what i'm doing I mean, I don't even watch trailers of movies because I, <laughs> I don't want to know anything. Um, yeah. Well, on that note, um, we've been going for a while, so let's cut it there. But uh, by the way, uh, if you haven't uh, encountered a Beholder, I hope you do in your game sooner than later because they're kind of fun to fight against. But uh, let's talk about the Monsters of the Wilderness, Oswald's Curse giveaway two soft covers will be given away to the lucky people who look and read very carefully in the description below uh and you'll be able to sign a uh, sign up uh, register uh partake in the adventure of how to get these books and uh, i'd highly recommend them because i have mine and uh yeah you can never yeah, go wrong just, with 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 these <clears throat> books like seriously just message us uh the name of this show uh, to one of our social media accounts. Uh, and today is June. Oh, no, it's not June yet. Today is May 31st. <laughs> so before June 2nd, uh, do that and we'll choose two people to mail those out to. And very, next very cool. week, we're back to classes and the always lovable Bard. That's right. It's going to be kind of awesome because I think you and I actually like Bards. I, I do because I like singing and making up songs and stuff. And as as my spouse will always tell me, oh, he never knows the words, but he always makes up new ones. But <laughs> um, it's definitely uh, one of the, again, I haven't played, I've played a bard, I think, once in the last few years. And uh, and that character didn't live very long, I seem to remember. <laughs> but uh, maybe I, I, I got to get away from tieflings. I got to get away from halflings. I got to get away from from all of those characters, sort of tropes that I've sort of adopted <laughs> and uh, and got to get into some new stuff. Like, I don't know, a dragonborn bard would be kind of fun. <laughs> Named Bruce. <laughs> but anyway... Uh, thank you again, Andrew, for coming out. Thank you all for watching. And also, don't forget, listen on the audio podcast, which the link will be down below. And uh, and if you ever, ever want to get a hold of us, uh, Andrew's email is in the description below, as well as uh, you could leave us a message on our podcasting website where you can actually leave a virtual voicemail that we will be notified about and can add into the audio version of the show or talk about or answer whatever questions you might have because we still have our own and uh, we're we're working through them thank you again and we'll see you next time later